Like every species that has ever graced the planet Earth, the game of football has had to evolve from its origin. And in many ways, those changes mirror the reasons that things evolve in the natural world too. To improve safety, to create more appeal, and even massive events that shift the balance all from one moment that sends out shockwaves through an entire population. Fortunately for us though, we don't have to wait billions of years to measure out how much the NFL has shifted since its founding from among a group of businessmen in an Ohio car dealership all the way back in 1920. In fact, let's take a look at a play just to see how much of the game was recognizable to today all the way back then. Alright, let's stop right there. This is a clip from 1930, which is already 11 years into the NFL's existence. But even if you've only watched a handful of football games in your life, you can probably tell that something's a little off with this picture. First of all, we've got 11 men on the field for each team, so that has managed to stick. But you'll notice that there's also not a lot of space between the players and this coach who's about three yards away from the nearest defensive lineman. That's because hash marks didn't exist yet, meaning plays could end up being run from right up against either team's bench. Speaking of, you might notice that those are a little bit empty. Because while pro football wasn't all the rage as a career yet, that's mainly because free substitution the way we know it now was prohibited, meaning each player played Iron Man at multiple positions. Oh, and by the way, a lot of modern formations hadn't been invented yet, and you also couldn't throw a pass without being at least five yards behind the line of scrimmage. So with the limited possibilities for what you could and couldn't do given field position and circumstance, you ended up with a lot of plays that looked like this one. Now, after that, I know that you'd love to watch some more Great Depression era football, but unfortunately we've got a good amount to cover, so come back with me to the present day. Here in 2019, we are celebrating the 100th year of the NFL's existence, and also coincidentally recently reaching 100,000 subscribers on this channel. So today, we're going to kill two birds with one stone and discuss both the most impactful rule changes and game trends the NFL has seen in its triple digit lifespan, and as a little bonus, I'll be answering a few of your questions at the end of the video in honor of all of you making the dreams of 12 year old me an insane reality. Seriously, thank you. But before I get ahead of myself and into a century of frustration and attempts to correct that frustration, I'd first like to thank SeatGeek for sponsoring this video. I'm sure plenty of you have heard of them by now, but if you haven't, SeatGeek compares ticket prices from all across the internet and puts them in one simple color-coded system to let you know what the absolute best deals are at a given venue. I'm not lying when I tell you that I have already personally been using this app for years, and now with us in the full swing of football season, there's seriously no better place to get tickets to go see your favorite team live and in person. So if you're looking to go to any live events in the near future, use my code SETTHEEDGE to get $20 off your first purchase at the link below. So thank you again to SeatGeek, and let's all dive leather helmet first into the driving forces that have made football what it is today. Now, the NFL is typically slow to adopt any kind of real philosophical change. While nowadays organizations are more willing to experiment with innovative systems to try and create the next big breakthrough, in the early days of the NFL, things moved at glacial speed, and the only true immediate effect to be seen was through further rule changes swinging the balance in a different direction. The best example of this is definitely in the history of the forward pass. Now, it wasn't even made legal in college football until 1906, when President Teddy Roosevelt was becoming increasingly concerned about how many people were literally dying each year playing the sport. Seriously, one of the most common formations was one where you just sent every player you had as hard as they could go straight up the middle in attempt to move the entire pile forward. Badass? Yes. But after 18 people died in 1905 alone, it was maybe time to move in a bit of a different direction. So thus, with a lot of debate and the helping hand of football sorcerer John Heisman, the legal forward pass came into being. But just because it existed doesn't mean that it was well accepted, even by the time that the NFL came around. Like I said before, you weren't allowed to throw the ball unless you were more than five yards behind the line of scrimmage until 1933, a rule that would be abolished after a controversial call in the league's championship game. 
Then teams were able to pass multiple times in a single set of downs without being penalized, and from that point forward, the ratio of run attempts to pass attempts inched closer and closer together by the year until 1982, when for the very first time, the amount of pass plays run in the league eclipsed that of running plays. Now, there had been a variety of innovators over the years that revolutionized the passing game and made it into a more viable way of moving the football. The Erdhart Perkins, and later Coriel and West Coast systems of play calling ushered in more simplicity and adaptability to offenses and emerging great minds across the league. But the driving force that's caused passing numbers to creep higher and higher each year since 1978 has undoubtedly been rule changes, and it all started with one of them that would change NFL offense forever. Cornerback Mel Blunt of the Pittsburgh Steelers was completely dominant. As part of the Steel Curtain, his trademark physicality against opposing receivers down the field completely snuffed out production and made a brutal defense that much harder to beat. And as his style of aggression and tenacity playing receivers all the way down the field began to spread throughout the NFL, the league quickly deemed that a rule change was in order. The answer from the competition committee was that there could be no more contact between defenders and receivers past five yards beyond the line of scrimmage. This rule would come to be known as the Mel Blunt rule, and it would lay the foundation for a shift towards the almost entirely passing-oriented league that we see nowadays. From then on in the sphere of the forward pass, we've seen a lot more rules, mainly safety-focused ones that have given quarterbacks more confidence to stand in the pocket knowing they aren't about to get obliterated by an edge rusher. A myriad of different rules have been instituted, like the ability to throw the ball away while outside the pocket, increasing protections of defenseless positions, low hits, and other clarifications that have continued to protect the quarterback's position, and later other ball carriers from helmet to helmet and defenseless hits as well. While these changes certainly haven't been popular with players in the secondary or linebackers who could absolutely murder a quarterback looking downfield, there's been careers that have been saved because of these rules, or at least the most protective of the group. But players like Mel Blunt don't necessarily stand alone in having forever affected the NFL rulebook, because particular players or plays throughout football history have caused shifts on that front for a variety of reasons. Take for instance this play, the Holy Roller, where Oakland Raiders quarterback Ken Stabler fumbled the ball forward as time expired, and then two more players continued the desperation move by batting it forward again, and then falling on it in the end zone to win the game. Creative, sure, and the Raiders would leave that day with a W, but soon after, the NFL instituted a rule stating that if a player fumbled forward at any time on fourth down or after the two-minute warning, only that player could recover the football, thereby ending any possibility of that play ever happening again. But if a single player's career instituting rule changes is more in your league, then there's always the Lester Hayes rule, originating from defensive back Lester Hayes' trademark use of stick'em to make catching the ball easier. Him slathering his hands with adhesive allowed him to pick off 13 passes in the 1980 season, and after that, the NFL decided maybe substances that turn your hands into glue traps were no longer allowed, unless you've got natural Spider-Man hands or something. Then there was Deacon Jones, a legendary Hall of Fame defensive end for the Rams who was so dominant he even coined the term quarterback sacks since he racked up so many of them. Jones was pretty much unblockable, in part due to his signature move the head slap, where he swiped the lineman blocking him in the helmet to give himself a split second advantage during the natural instinct to blink or flinch when someone swings at your head. And man, did it work. In fact, it was so effective that once he retired, it was deemed unfair and barred from the game. And we haven't ever seen another player with Deacon Jones' playstyle since. Of course, there's more recent examples of single-actor rule changes as well, like Navarro Bowman's forced fumble in the 2013 NFC Championship game. As he was bringing down Seahawks wide receiver Jermaine Kearse, Bowman clearly strips and maintains possession of the ball before hitting the ground. Unfortunately, he would both suffer a season-ending injury on that play and not be awarded with a fumble recovery, as referees ruled on the field that it was Seattle's ball, and instant replay rules at the time stated fumbles were only reviewable in either the end zone or on the sidelines. Why this was ever a rule, I personally have no clue about. But fortunately, it didn't take too long after this play to institute that any fumble on the field would be reviewable from then on. 
Then there's the most recent example, of course, which is one that I understand is still quite a bit of a sore subject. At any rate though, we're already seeing the impacts that that single missed call from last year's NFC Championship game has had on football this season. There's been some calls corrected, but in many cases, calls have become even more convoluted as a result of reviews, and now the micro-defining of pass interference that has to follow that. Let's face it, NFL rules have always been a spontaneous mess. Whether it's defining what a catch is, or what a fumble is, there should probably just be a law that for every new rule created, you'll eventually need two more to fix it down the line. But that's sort of the beautiful thing about football. For every new leak you patch, another one springs up, because it's an imperfect game coached and refereed by imperfect people, which does provide plenty of opportunity for fans of all ages to come together and just yell at their television. And at the end of the day, that's really all football fans have ever wanted. Heckling referees was a staple long before the TV even existed, and it still remains one today. Now more than ever, possibly, with the clown show that has been NFL officiating in the 2019 season. But there's no doubt the sport of football itself has come a long way from the early days of college and even the early days of professional clubs back a hundred years ago, where not much resembles the current game today. No numbers on jerseys, no infinite helmet models to throw tantrums over, things have gotten significantly more complex, there's no doubt about that. But while that complexity can be frustrating at times, it's evolved football into one of the deepest and most intellectual games at the professional level. So as the sport continues to develop into what is hopefully a more objective and safer game overall, as we reflect on the NFL's 100th year, let's all just be glad that it exists in our lives in the first place. Sorry to have to cut the outro short like that, but like I said before, we do have a Q&A to do. Some of you guys asked some really good questions, and some of you didn't ask questions at all, but regardless, let's go ahead and get into it. So we'll start with where are you from and how old are you, because you have to respect a good direct question like that. So I'm from the great state of Florida. It's where I was born, where I was raised. It's kind of a circus sometimes, it's very hot, but you know, it's home. Uh, also, I'm 19 years old and going on 20 in a couple months, so I'm clinging on to my teen years, but, but they're almost up. I heard you have one of the coolest Discord servers of all time. Can we catch a link? Yes and yes. I do have a Discord server. It is awesome. There's a lot of great people on it if you're looking to talk NFL football or you know whatever's going on in your life, honestly. So if you're interested, I'll actually put a link down pinned in the comments. So just click on that and come join us. Love to have you. The greatest of all time, Highlight Heaven asks, who inspired you to make your channel? Um, this is a good question. I've gotten it from a lot of people. And I've been on YouTube forever and ever since I was a kid. So I've watched a lot of channels over my life. But in terms of like NFL content, there's so many great content creators out there like Brett Coleman or John Boys, KTO, Flemlo Raps. I could continue on for like half an hour, but there's just been so many people that I've watched over the years. And I would say that's definitely been a huge inspiration to me in, in my content. So I'll leave links to those guys down in the description. So definitely go check them out if you're not already subscribed, which you should be. I hope I don't sound boring using my normal voice. I know that you guys are probably used to me using a lot more inflection and things like that. But um, anyways, moving on. So Sad Man Baseball, which uh, big shout out to him as well. He makes incredible content. He asks, I need to know your most significant influences on your sense of style in your videos. Uh, that's a great question. If I were to like narrow it down to a YouTuber, it would probably be KTO. I've been a huge fan of him forever. He definitely inspired me to start doing the commentary over footage kind of aspect of my videos and all of that. But you know, outside of that, I'm not really sure of another like huge influence in terms of what I kind of go for or shoot for on the channel, other than just trying to make things kind of smooth and cohesive throughout. But uh, I hope that's a good enough answer. Which football player was your childhood favorite? Um, for me, it was definitely Tim Tebow. I grew up such a huge Florida Gators fan, and that was kind of right around the time of his rise. Plus, he was left-handed, which I'm also left-handed, so, you know, it was just like a perfect match. And things didn't work out in the end, but he was just so dominant as a college football player that he is definitely going to have a long-standing legacy regardless. Um, Sergio asks, how did you become a Bucks fan? This is pretty boring story actually. I was just born in Florida, Central Florida, so yeah, kind of geography has determined my loyalty, but go Bucks. 
Mike, who also gets a shout out, he is awesome, go check him out. He asks, ice cream or cookies? Now, I like how we're getting to some heavy hitters here. Um, I, that's a, that's a good question. There's kind of two schools of thought. Cookies are definitely more convenient, and I think they're more reliable, but ice cream is just like a higher tier, I feel like. So, probably ice cream in, in a, in a vacuum. Who is your favorite player that's not on the Buccaneers? Um, this might be a blasphemous thing for me to say, but probably Julio Jones on the Falcons. He is just incredible. I love the way he approaches the game. Just a great guy and super dominant at what he does. Also, Saquon Barkley. I am so excited to watch him play for the next however many years he's in the league. He is just incredible and the sole reason I would want to watch a Giants game. What was the first NFL football game you have gone to? If you did, of course, do you remember the outcome? Yeah, it's actually a lot more recent than you might expect. It was the opener for the 2017 Bucks season against the Bears. Um, they decimated the Bears. I remember hearing chants for Trubisky in like the third quarter. So after them being on like hard knocks and having their expectations through the roof, uh, my expectations went, of course, way too high and they missed the playoffs. But uh, that was the first NFL game I can remember, other than like a preseason game a couple years before, but I wouldn't really count that. Bob Doctor asks, are you hungry? Uh, thank you, Bob, first of all, for asking. Uh, and I'm not too hungry right now, but, but I could eat. So, yeah, that, that's that. And for what will probably be our final question, Cole Adams, another great guy, go subscribe to him. What are your top three movies and TV shows of all time? Um, starting with movies, probably putting Pulp Fiction up at number one. I'm just a huge Quentin Tarantino fan in general. And then after that, probably Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the old one with Gene Wilder. It's just untouchable and has such a huge part of my childhood. Uh, for number three, I'm probably going to make it a tie between The Shining and Whiplash, which was released more recently if you haven't heard of it. Uh, go check out all of those movies if you haven't seen them yet. They're all great. Almost forgot to answer the second part of that question about TV shows, and I actually don't watch that many TV shows, so I'm going to have to give a very basic answer. Uh, I watched Breaking Bad, which was excellent. I watched Game of Thrones, which was excellent, um, until a pretty disappointing last couple seasons. But other than that, I'm trying to get into Mindhunter now, so we'll see if I can finish it. But, yeah. So with that, we will wrap up the 100,000 subscriber Q&A. Uh, even saying that number is still kind of crazy to me because I never thought that we'd even hit that mark, let alone this insanely quickly. So that is all thanks to you guys. You guys have been such an incredible community here, so supportive of my content. So from the bottom of my heart, truly thank you guys. This is such a huge milestone for me and it means the world, honestly. So with all of that said, there are more videos on the way. So have a great rest of your day, morning, night, whenever, and I will see you again soon. Take care.